Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, we have, we have quite a show today. I tell you what, we're going to be talking about the solutions to our problems here in the city of Portland. In, in Oregon, okay? I've got three dynamic guests with me. You see, you may see three on the set, but we got three. You know what I'm saying? We got three. We got three, we got three dynamic people that are gonna talk about the solutions to the issues, the upcoming solutions to the issues of our issue in regards to the whole issue of police, right? Police, their definition, and the citizens' concerns, or whatever. Well, joining me today, my dear friend, my dear friend, um, how about Fred Stewart? Fred, how you doing today? How you doing, Mr. Broussard? Okay. Fred is going to be running for city council. He's running for city council against a guy by the name of Steve Novak. And again, this is another invitation right off the bat. I, Steve, I think please, it's Steve Novak. Is it Steve Novak? Yeah, Steve well, Novak. I'm not familiar. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll probably get a little bit more familiar with him once, they, once he comes on and I interview him. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's sort of an issue there. But I've interviewed him once before, you know, once before when he was running the first time around. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we've got Fred Stewart here. In fact, sometimes he's, he's even referred to as the our local Trump here in the, in the state of Oregon here. Uh, the point of the matter is Trump has kind of gotten a sort of a definition from the standpoint of uh, he says what's on his mind. And I think the people love him for that matter. They don't like, they, they, people just not, don't, they don't like politicians today. They really want solutions. They want to know what's going on. And I think that's a very, very important piece. So in that, on all due respect, Fred, we want to thank you for taking that piece. I think it, I think it fits in all due respect. I mean, Fred, I don't know if you know about his background, but he's a, he's a very successful realtor. He's very, very much involved in community. As you know, he's been on this show on a number of occasions uh, talking about the issues, issues that people don't want to talk about, and which we're going to be talking a little bit more about today. But uh, he's very well, very well placed, if you will, and as far as I'm concerned, more than qualified, if you will, to not only run for city council, but be a good, strong city council person. Again, he's an outsider. He's not an insider politician, per se. So I think that's a very, very important piece. And then just my, to my, my left on your screen, but to my right, a gentleman by the name of Don Tupay. You've seen this one, Behind the Badge in River City, here on this particular show. Uh, an excellent read, an excellent read. Former Portland police officer, has the background. It's kind of interesting that Don is so interesting because here we are talking about all of these new factions uh, within our own Portland Police Department today. But Don goes back in time, and he was there on the force back during those days when, in all due respect, when the guy was actually doing community policing and talking to people on the street, right. and more specifically in northeast Portland, in northeast Portland. Again, maybe you need to find this book somewhere. You Check it out. It's, it's around. Just Hey, it's Behind the Badge in River City, a Portland Police Memoir. Don DuPay with a forward by Phil Stanford and Teresa. Yeah, that is, you know said Teresa there? Something like you that. You saw that right there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Teresa DuPay, his wife. But the bottom line is that Don is here, and uh, in all due respect, uh, then my next guest here on the line is a guy named Bruce Broussard, who will probably be looking at the possibility of throwing his hat in to run for the mayor of the city of Portland. What about that? And to my left and to my to my right, if you will, and to your left is my new chief of police, Don Dupay. We're going to straighten this city up. I figure with a city council, we, that means we got two votes on there, right? Right, Fred? Absolutely. We're going we're to do the yeah. job. We're going to do the job. Yeah. It's not saying anything in all due respect, folks, but the fact of the matter is we need to talk about the issue here. We're a small town. We've got to solve this problem. Yeah. We've got to solve this problem. We're not trying to take anything light with reference to our existing police department. Or if not that, our existing city council to a certain degree. But the fact that maybe something has to be done, and we've got to, and we got to all move from the top on down. So we're going to have this discussion today. It's going to be just great. So Fred, why don't we just start off with you right off the bat and just give us a little blurb about your rationale for running for the mayor of the city. Uh, mayor, well, you should, I'm, I'm giving you two hats at one time. But anyway, I'm so excited about the fact that you're going to be running for city council. What do you think? Why are you running? Well, I'm, I'm running because I feel I can do the job better, definitely than Steve Novick. I feel I care a lot more than Steve Novick. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's, it's time that these people who moved to Portland, like he has, um, to run Portland, are challenged by people who are from Portland. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have not had people on city council in quite some time that their, their hearts are not, the people we've got right now, their hearts aren't based on what's best for the city. Their hearts are, are, are based right now on what's best for their politics. And the city commissioner job is more than just a political position. It is a political position. But before it's a political position, it is a um, position of service, public service. 
They're all public servants up there. And their goal should be what's in the best interest of the people of Portland. I want to challenge that. I do not feel Steve Novick has the best interest of the city of Portland in mind in any time, any type of decision he has made since he's become city commissioner. Mm-hmm. You know, Fred, I, I totally I, agree. You, you, I agree too. I, I really totally do. Agree, yeah. But you know, the other thing, the, the, the thing, the highlighted thing about your particular running for office is that you spend a lot of time in community. You know, and when, I, when I'm thinking about right along with police, you sit down with these folks. You, you've been there. You, you, you've talked to all of them for that matter, and to get a sense of what their issues were, mm-hmm. what issues are, if you will. And I think that's going to be very, very important. Yeah. It's going to be very, very important because right now they feel alone. They feel that they're out there by themselves, and and I guess that's why I get this point about the, and that's a major concern about the fact that they feel well, we have to run the city. We're doing it ourselves, and in all due respect. They don't have the, and the people are concerned saying, wait a minute, we are the city and we want someone to represent us. And all due respect, the, either the mayor and the city council are supposed to be doing the job. But in all due respect, they're not doing the job. They're not doing the job. Well, this is going to be refreshing to get it. What do you think about that? Well, to me, I mean, I agree with you 100%. Uh, the people we've got at city council right now, the way they, they approach the city, uh, for a lot of them, the city of Portland doesn't even exist after you cross 82nd. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're black, they don't, you don't exist. And, Unless they feel Willamette Week or Oregonian's going to write, you know, a bad article, um, these aren't people that we that we can rely on so far to build relationships with the community that they are um, sworn to serve. I mean, they're just not curious enough. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to the average working man, they they just don't feel it. They don't they don't feel the average uh, working man and working woman in this space that we're living in right now. Uh, I tell everybody I decided to run before the street fee, but the street fee was just uh, salt on top of the wound. Mm-hmm. An absolute disregard for wh- how what their decisions are going to do to the average person in Portland that isn't in their best earning years or isn't ha- ha- um, uh, somebody who has a huge bank account. Uh, the assumption that any small business is just going to accept what they're telling them they can't accept. I mean... Like I said, uh, we, we need people who want to serve on city council to understand before you're a politician, because you are a politician if you're on city council. You know, one area you, that you are a public servant. Right, exactly. You know, one other area that I know you're almost, you're definitely expertise because of your background in real estate and that aspect of it. Look at what's going on right now. I mean, we hear the word gentrification well, do, from yeah. that particular area, but I don't see anything's happening. No one is saying it. Only reacting from the standpoint, like the mayor, so I got 20 million bucks I'm going to put on the table. And then people are moving to Salem, I mean, moving to Gresham and all this, that, and the other. You see all this high rise and whatever, mm-hmm. parking issue and whatever. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, Any you know, thoughts? we could do a lot more when it comes to housing in Portland, more than just uh, pandering to some Rolodex Negroes so they will stop, you know, screaming and yelling in front of the cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, we need a broad based uh, commitment, a broad based plan, and how we're going to have inclusionary housing in our development as we move forward in this city. We flat out need that. Um, we need to look more at our traffic, uh, at our traffic plan as, a, as it relates to our housing plans um, because there is a connection here. Right now, the people are getting the benefit, and they should be getting the benefit, of our, our, our incredible investment in, in transportation, bikes, light rail, everything else, are people who are doing well financially in life, mm-hmm. you know, whereas the people who do need it the most are people who aren't doing very well. The further we push uh, lower income people back, the for, further the further we push people who make who live in households uh, that gross less than seventy five thousand dollars a year mm-hmm. out, the more costly it is for them to go to work, the more costly it is for them to get the goods and services that they need, and that is not good for Portland long term. Now, we, this is this is for both of you guys, going on. commissioner and mayor. Mm-hmm. Yes. We need to go back and find out. What happened to the ten-year housing plan? There you go. Okay. What happened? Nobody okay. talks about yeah, it. That's right. And it and it began in about 2005 when I was working at the homeless shelter transition projects. We started, and the, and the city uh, jumped right into it. Yeah, this is a good thing to do. The ten-year housing plan, and I have talked to two different people that used to work with me at the at the shelter, mm-hmm. and I've asked them the same question: What happened to the ten-year housing mm-hmm. plan? Well, we stopped talking about it. It just disappeared off the table. Hmm. They forgot about it in about two years. 
So that's my question to Charlie Hales. Yes. What happened to the plan? Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. go forward. Let's go. Let, let's see what happened to it, and maybe we could do something about it now. I mean, you just have a plan. You have this goal. You put your money into mm -hmm. it, and then oh well, the hell with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good it point. It just disappeared. That's mm -hmm. a good point. Fact, and, add on to what. Yeah, go on. Keep going. And the other thing. The other thing is that, is that for some reason or other, Mr. Novick seems to think that adding more parking meters is a good idea. Mm -hmm. He's confused by the fact that parking meters aren't making any money, that they've got 50 people out there writing parking tickets that don't make any money, and now he wants to add more parking meters that aren't going to make any money. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is, in my opinion, is to shut those parking meters down at least three days a week mm -hmm. because it's driving business away from the city. People are not wanting to come downtown because I got to mess with the parking. Mm -hmm. The parking is expensive. It's a dollar sixty cents an hour, mm -hmm. you know. And if you get a parking ticket, that's thirty nine dollars. That's grocery no, money. No, that's fifty dollars. Uh, I know firsthand. I just got one for thirty nine bucks. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, over, the, one hour over. There's parking. a difference between two guys. I'm not going to get it. Uh oh. <laughs> Don't tell me they're giving a black man yeah, a white man a different saying. ticket. I think so. I think we got to so. check into I, I that. Think, oh, gee, bro, are you but gonna handle that? I posted right. mine on Facebook. <laughs> it's not right. Yeah, that's right. It's right, not right. right. You know, you've got to you got to stop driving the business away from the city. Right. And parking meters, Mr. Novick, are driving business away from the city. Plain and simple. We got to figure that out. Right. We got to stop doing that. That's not good for business, mm -hmm. Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Merritt. We've yes, got to yes, stop yes. driving business that, right. away from the city. Well, Chief, you know, you made some good points. You know. That's you know what the chief is going to do? Yes. The chief is going to start citing yes. bicycles. Yes. Now that the was worst everything. offenders yes. and on yes. on the streets yes. Yes. That, that run the red lights, run the stop signs, and get run over and killed. So then they paint green stripes on right. the on the on the asphalt, and they think, gee, that's going to make a difference. Right. Right. No, now they've decided the green on the asphalt isn't making any difference. making a difference. So we're going to erase it. Going to erase it. Yeah, and gotcha. I'm wondering when in the hell. Did riding a line on the sidewalk or the street ever make any difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the white stripe down the middle don't keep people on their yeah, side of the road. Right. The white line over here it doesn't keep people in their own lane. Right. And the green, the green stripe would just get bicycle people exactly. killed. Yeah. And the other thing is they need to have insurance. Mm -hmm. They need to have basic liability insurance. If you're going to be riding on the same asphalt that I drive on, that I'm you need for. to have. Citizens, oh, you everybody need to pay. have. Right. You need to have liability insurance. Well, I agree with that because if you I ever run into a biker. Revenue I'm definitely suing for PTSD. What about senior citizens? You know what I mean? We've got a number of senior yeah. citizens living in this old community. Yeah. What about tricycles? I mean, rather, and on tricycles, you know what I'm saying? So they can get on and ride Stay out there. on the, the sidewalk. You understand what I'm saying? Well, make them wide enough so that seniors can enjoy themselves when also, When I was a too. kid, it was against the law to ride on the street. Yeah, how about that? That was a bad mistake, changing that. Yeah, get, get the Cub Scouts and whatever. But anyway, as you can see, folks, we got a dynamic trio here. And we we got to talk about some of these issues. In fact, let, let me ask you about that. What do you think about the bicycle situation? Don brought up a good point. What, what, what are we well, going? I like. I gotta be honest. I like the bicycles. We are. That's fine. We, but what we, about the rest too, of the city? We need, but not on my street. Well, we got them in some streets. I mean, you got to have. Give if them we didn't North have people South. riding bikes in Portland right now, yeah. our crowd of st streets would be at least double what we are seeing right now. I mean, I don't think people quite understand how many people are moving to Portland, and how many of these people that are coming to Portland are bringing their cars. And we right now, the the way Portland is is and the way we're set up unless we want to start building up when it comes to building freeways we don't have a lot of land in which we can expand freeways so we do need bikes well charlie just signed off on this uber thing i mean geez everybody's out there in the attack everybody's well a taxi, if i get elected driver. What if, about I, that if, I, if i get elected there's gonna be some deal? changes with uber jesus christ i mean what, there's gonna be some changes where did that with come uber? from fred did you talk to have you talked with the charlie at all no they don't talk to me they don't talk to you what do you mean you, me. you're a taxpayer oh no, i i never get a return isn't that why you're running for I office I, matter of fact i called wait a minute, wait i called, minute, I called steve's office before i came out that i was running for office yes because I wanted to, you know, Sit talk to him. With him you know, I got respect for him. I haven't gotten a return okay. phone call. No. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not a Rolodex no, 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 wait a minute. So I'm not going to get a return phone no, call. No, this is a government. They're not worried, people. They're not worried that I'm going to go got, run into the media problem. and say, hey, wait, wait, Fred, they won't Fred, call this black Fred, man back. They're Fred, racist. Fred, Fred. No, Fred, this is a government of the people, yeah. by the people, and for the people, for all the people. I know. You're not excluded, you know, just because you're black. I'm excluded. Everybody black who's not a Rolodex Negro gets excluded by these guys. Let me check out the Rolodex get to Rolodex status. <laughs> and it takes a lot of work 
and a lot of commitment. But once you yeah. get to Rolodex status, you get a return phone call. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Charlie's known me since 1992. Um, Charlie don't call, call me back. And then um, Steve has known me since March of 2007. Well, he's done the same thing with me. Yeah. Yeah, so when he first went, when he but ran you're not a Rolodex Negro. Oh, really? Is that what the deal is? You, Jesus. St- right. You got to be a Rolodex Negro in that. order to get a return phone call yeah, yeah. from these people. Are you saying that the people that are working for them are Rolodex, the, the, the Negroes that are working for them? There's very few black people that work for these guys that aren't in Rolodex, or at least they're working hard. At, they're, they're taking classes to get into the Rolodex class. Really? Of Negro. Wow. They're working on it. Boy, I, I mean, self-assured, uh, community-minded, um, black folks that don't have any criminal background or, or ganged-up family members, they don't like those type of black people. Because, uh, you know, black people like that are too, you know, multicultural, t- too hard to control. Oh, wow, wow. Hey, guys, but but if you are a Rolodex Negro, Rolodex, you, you get a return you, you phone call. Down. Really? Yeah. Except Dan. Every time I've ever called Dan Salzman, every time I've ever called Nick Fish, I get a return. Uh, or Amanda Fritz, I've gotten a return. Amanda, I've, gotten, yeah. okay. I've gotten a call back yeah, from yeah, yeah. So I shouldn't say all of them are that way. Mm-hmm. I'll just say... Charlie and uh, Novick. and and, Novick. and and Novick are definitely one of those. That's their that's their way. And that's interesting. Yeah. But they're not the only white people that do that. Well, hey guys, let, let's get back on on the subject, man, because I've got my chief sitting right here, and he, he, yeah. we want to talk a little bit about that piece. <clears throat> talk about this whole issue of of this police relationship aspect of it, and the and the definition that that's being given them today. I'm talking about Portland now, Portland, Oregon. Uh, Don, you can talk a little bit about the, what how it was during your day. And then, uh, Fred, let's talk about today because you've talked to these guys. You've sat down with them. You've driven in the cars with them. You've spoke to them at Lent and aspect of it. Let's start off with you, and then Don can kind of comment from the standpoint of how that related from bringing it up to date. The first thing what, I want to point what's out the, what's about, the problem? What, about, what's the issues with that? about our cops is we got to make a lot of changes with the Portland police. Okay. But this is a perfect time to do it. Yeah. The cops that we've got on the street right now are probably the youngest overall batch of cops we've had since probably the early 1970s. Right, right. A lot of the cops that have caused the problems over the years mm-hmm. and the relationship with the black community and the relationship with the community in general, they've retired. Mm-hmm. And a lot, some of them are even out of state completely. But when I go and I look at these cops today, I'm, see, I'm seeing a lot of cops that are young enough to be my kid. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I've got friends I went to high school with that have got kids mm-hmm. that are Portland cops. Mm-hmm. So you've got to look at this community of cops a little different. It's in, a, it's in a position of transition. And what we need on city council, we need people who are willing to engage in making this transition, this yeah. change of Portland, yeah. you know, in our Portland police. This is the time that, that we can make some changes in culture. We get, we, this is when we can correct a lot of the bad habits we've got. We've got to stop harking on so much things that happened before. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can't forget them. And I'm not saying we necessarily need to forgive them, Mm -hmm. but we do need to focus on from here for what kind of police department we want. We need to understand, we need to identify for law enforcement what we want them to do and not do. And right now, I don't think we're doing that. I don't think we have the leadership right now that's trying, that's got a a vision of 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, what kind of cops we have. Because look, these cops that we've got today that are in their 20s, 25 years from now, they're going to be running the Portland police. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You understand? So what changes do we need to make with these cops yeah. today? To, so they can do their job. So they can do their job, yeah. protect yeah. us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Protect themselves. Exactly. Okay? Um, so, yeah, that's that's my take on cops. But, we, but that not what saying. Right. Um, we need to take 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 up on this opportunity right now while the when the iron's hot. Don, I want to bring you in now from the standpoint. You yeah. know, we had talked a little bit about that in terms of what were your concern and some of the concerns you had when that transition, with, i.e., when we went when we sort of sort of basically opened it up to women and yeah. and everybody else. Talk a little bit. <clears throat> what, what do you think, Don? How do we solve this? Well, police work today is basically the same as police work was 25 or 30 years ago. 40 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing that's changed is technology. Uh, now, instead of grabbing you by the shoulder and say, come with me, young man, mm-hmm. I can stand back 15 feet, and if you scare me, I can tase you. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to touch you. Mm-hmm. I don't have to put on the blue gloves. Mm-hmm. You know, and I can do the same thing with my chemical spray. You can get there, mm-hmm. the mace can mm-hmm. get you 15 mm-hmm. feet away. Mm-hmm. So we need to go back to 
things that make people scared. And one of the things that people are scared of are tasers. Tasers. Tasers have been declared by the uh, Amnesty International as electronic torture devices. And they say the police should never use them. I agree. Tasers need to go. Mm -hmm. They need to get back to more hands-on police work. Mm -hmm. let's, get away, let's get away from these chemicals. Let's make it more open. Uh, the Portland police now are insulated from the people they work for, the citizens. Mm -hmm. They're insulated by strong union contract, mm -hmm. and they're insulated by internal affairs. It's, uh, internal affairs was basically developed uh, as an outcome of the Probasco decision years ago. Probasco filed a class action lawsuit against 30 cops mm -hmm. and all the commissioners and the mayor. <clears throat> and the judgment was, well, they need to do some things different. But one of the things that they mistakenly allowed was internal affairs. Mm -hmm. And as long as, as long as the police don't have to report to the citizens as long as they are protected by internal affairs, it will never change. It will never change as long as I don't have to, mm. I don't have to pay attention to what you say, my boss, because you don't matter. I'm not reporting to you. I'm reporting to the union. If but you the, don't have but the concerns that they have, but, but let me break in this one. <clears throat> but, but again, one of the major concerns that I see that the cops have a lot of times is the fact mm. they have no leadership. They're just yeah. out there by themselves. Yeah. They're out there by themselves. I mean, the mayor's not responding. He's supposed to be the leader. But, you know, I'm constantly saying that the point is that uh, what they I need, see is that they, if, need, if, if they need leadership. If, if you didn't have internal affairs, say if the Portland police got rid of internal affairs, what should take its place? Open. It should be done in, uh, in, uh, in uh, ideally a city council setting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Leadership. You, you mess up. You, this guy, uh, you accuse uh, this person, and then we're going to hold a hearing in city council, and mm -hmm. all of the citizens are invited to come. Yeah, yeah. You can bring your lawyer if you want, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you're found guilty, you're going to pay. And then well, if you're found not guilty, right. we'll pay. Right. Now, we've got cams. We've got, we got a few more minutes here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about these cams that are coming up now? What do you think about those cams? Cameras? Cameras. Those cams on the lapel, you think they're going to work? Are they going to turn them on when they want to or off? Or Cameras what? scare me because okay. I don't want a cop with a camera in my house. Okay. Uh, if I can keep him out of it, you know, I'm not going to let him do it. The other problem is if they can turn them on and off, they shouldn't have them. Mm -hmm. When you get in the car, the camera should be turned on by your sergeant, and it don't turn off until you get uh, off, off a shift. Interesting. And then that information goes up to a cloud, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can't mess with it. Right, right, right. That's the only way we're going to keep it open. Right. As long as I can turn the camera off, oh, no. I can turn the microphone Fred, off. what do you think? It's your city council you know, person. That, now, what do you think about that camera? That's a tough one. I like What's that up? idea. What are you going to do? I like that idea about a cop not being able to turn the camera off, but then I look on the police officer standpoint. There are things they say, and there are things they do in their car that are 100% legal, 100% part of the job. I don't necessarily want the world to know that they're doing. You know, I don't want people learning what the lingo is for, for a cop. Like what talking. lingo? What are you talking well, about? You know, cop, cops have their own little codes like, and what? stuff like, like that. Like, like, what? like what? you know, we've all heard the whole thing. Like what? 10-4, 187. But they have a lot of other ways in like which what? they you're communicate. Like what? You're smiling when you're saying that. Well, no. saying. Like what? No, they have a lot of other ways that they can communicate. Hold it. Like communicate what? Communicate when they're in stressful situations. Kiss my butt or something? No, or nothing like that. Well, what, like nothing what? Like, like that. F you or something? No, or what? nothing like that. So we like have, what? We, but, hey, I'm going to blow your brains out or no, something? No, nothing like what? that. Tell me what Bruce, it is. Bruce, I've gone through the what whole direct I said they're totally legal and acceptable ways What's legal? I don't know anything about legal. I know, but it was just like when we were in the Marines, and Marines in every unit have their own way of communicating things across what they're going to do next so they can coordinate actions. Cops need to be able to do that, too. Like what? I... Well, anything. Hey, I'm gonna anything from I'm gonna Don, take a look. Don, you answer the to question. Look, to Don, look, you, I have, I have, he was a cop. I've run the background Don check. Don was a cop. Don was a cop. I've done the background. Hold it. Don was a cop. Let me let me finish. No, but you have said anything. A, a cop says <laughs> I've done the background check on somebody. There's a warrant, and we're gonna arrest him. Okay. How do you say that in a way in which the people that you're about to ready to ar ar arrest don't know automatically that they have been caught? In other words, you you don't know the situations cops are in. They want to be able to be able to communicate in a way in which they can manage the situation no, no, but, but so who, people can't get hurt. Yeah, yeah, but who's the professor? 
That's why the chiefs got to be here. See, mm -hmm. see, see. My point is that as a chain of command here, and they get training and it's yeah. training, and the people need to know exactly what that training is all about. But what you're saying, but what you're saying is that that's not going to be a part of. It. They're going to do their own thing. Well, no, that's a problem. No, if you don't no. turn, if you can turn the camera off, that's right. Yeah. See, I don't like don't that have, part. Then you don't have transparency. That's right. See, that's see, the thing is, I will, I'm, I agree I with him on the. Use the word there, transparency. I want transparency like that, too. We're just doing. I would love, right now. want transparency too, but I also want to be fair. I want to make sure law enforcement's not in, encumbered. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at both sides. I'm not even saying I've made a decision on which one I want. But, you but I see both sides. Yeah, but you I represent see, the citizens. I don't want. Hold it. I don't <laughs> want a cop compromising an investigation or an action. Okay, but then again, I don't want a cop doing something illegal and having the ability to cut the camera off either. No, but you what he said. Yeah. It solved the problem. You t the Sarge turned it on when you get on the job, and then he yeah. turned it off when you get off. But the things move too quick sometimes. Too quick. Well, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, look. Wait, it's wait, 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 it's wait, only wait, important hold, hold, to figure out. Hold your point. Don, you to figure it Chief, out. What do, you think? what do you think, Chief? you got to have transparency. You do. And, and if you... You do. If they are... Afraid that they're going to do something illegal. If the camera's going not to not illegal, that, Wait a minute, yeah, let him talk. Let him talk. Illegal. Well, I know, I know, I know. No, let, let, but I'm let, not let, talking let, about the illegal let, stuff. Let, let him, let him talk. Then they can't turn the camera off. Correct. So then they're not going to do those illegal things. Cops have done a lot of illegal things over okay, the time. Okay. You know, my book yeah. is full of them. And, yes. And see, and wait, I, and I, I agree with it. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Go on. My book yeah, is full of the illegal things that cops have been done have done in the past that wouldn't have been done if there'd have been a camera on. Okay. 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 I like gotcha. writing, okay. writing tickets and on I, tombstone. And see, and that's where I'm torn too. See, okay. I, uh, on one hand, I'm big proponent for the for the cameras because I feel there's a too much amb ambiguity between the word of a cop and the word of a citizen. And when I say ambiguity, a cop walks in, they're automatically adopted as telling the truth, even when they're not. We need something in the middle to be the equalizer. And the most fair way to equalize her is the camera. Now, but the other part of the the other part of the really thing really is, quick. I don't know if I want a cop um, filming every single thing they do. You understand? Because there are things, there are discussions they have both internally and with, and with citizens. We, you know, we're trying to get people to snitch. Do I want a cop filming a snitch? <laughs> yes, and do okay. I want a cop? Hold up, we got about three. We got three. We got about three minutes now. The only thing I can say to you, I'm, mm -hmm. again, like I'm sitting there now too as mayor, right? You mm -hmm. got me. My chief has just la laid out a presentation to the entire city council. Mm -hmm. Now we're taking a vote. We're going to take the deal. <laughs> Done deal, right, chief? I want. Well, look, I want the cameras. I want, I want the cameras. The, 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 me too. Okay. No, I want well, look, we got about three more minutes, and then actually, I want you to respond to the whole bit issue of uh, Black Lives Matter, as far as we've been hearing this whole piece about mm -hmm. police, and how, did, how does that fit, and how do you respond to that? Well, I'm glad that there's a black, black... For Portland, Oregon. For Portland, Oregon, I'm glad there's a Black Lives Matter, matter movie. I don't trust Don't Shoot Portland, but I'm glad there's a Black Lives Matter. Uh, I'm glad the discussion is going on, mm -hmm. but at the same respect, I want it also uh, geared toward all Black Lives Matter, and, and uh, upset at everybody who takes a black life. We've had over 500 black lives taken by black gang members since mm -hmm. August 18th, mm -hmm. 1988. Mm. We've, in the entire history of, of Portland, Oregon, a good friend of ours, J.D. Chal Challenger, says we might be 200 or so from the Portland cops. In other words, Portland cops in 115 years maybe have shot 200, tried and killed 200 black people in over 100 years, mm. whereas in 27 years, over 500 black people have been killed by black wow. folks. So oh, when I hear Black Lives Matter, yeah, I want to hold cops accountable. Um, one of the things I, I'm, I'm asking people about is, um, you know, whether or not we should make it an absolute un intolerable offense for a cop to shoot somebody unarmed, mm -hmm. even if it's ruled um, mm -hmm. uh, justified. Mm -hmm. You know, what, if a cop shoots somebody unarmed, they should lose their job, even if they're exonerated. Okay, my chief is making some other point. Now, he's making a presentation now, yeah. you know, to yeah. the council. What do you think about that, chief? Oh, that's dead wrong. <clears throat> there are so, a lot of people who were big enough to overpower me when I was a cop, and probably still, that never had a weapon. That doesn't mean that I'm not terrified. It doesn't mean they can't hurt me, because I've been hurt. Mm -hmm. I was hurt by... Uh, but back then... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let him get through. I was hurt back when I was working vice by six guys that jumped on me for an arrest that I made at Van's Olympic room, and I got hurt pretty bad. But the, and none but of them wait, had a gun. But what if you had wait, a wait, taser? Wait, 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 what I had what, a gun. But what if you had a taser? I wouldn't have used it. I had a mm -hmm. gun, I didn't shoot him either. See, 
Okay. 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 But look, guys. Look, okay. look like we're gonna spend a little bit more time on okay. that part. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We want to do a little bit more time, but but the fact of the matter is, we run out of time at this point in time, folks. We're gonna bring bring Fred back, and maybe we might be able to get you, you guys, Steve Novick, to come back here with you. I'd can, love. Can you debate yeah. with you? I'd love to have well, Steve hey, here. Steve, Steve, Please come invite on him. Too. We're gonna invite. I would him. love. Him. I want to talk to Steve a lot. Well, Steve, Steve good. would be a good Sounds interview. Good. Sounds good. Steve's smart. Sounds good. It would be great for Portland good. if we did that a lot. Sounds great. Okay, we're gonna take a short break, folks, and we'll be right back. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Again, welcome to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And folks, uh, again, thank you for being with us. Today. we got quite a show this time around. And uh, we just happen to have an individual that's, uh, that's well-known and, and well-versed. And uh, I mean, in all due respect, he's very engaged, if you will, uh, here in the state of Oregon. And, uh, and specifically, he has really been an, an advocate, if you will, for black Oregonians. And I'll just be straight up with you. And he's, he's formed an organization called the Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs. It's been around for years, been around for years. And I'll, I'll have Cal give you a little bit more insight in terms of some of the things, some of the highlights, if you will, of the organizations. But uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, I think he's an integral part in some of the issues that, we're, that, are, uh, that, that needs to be addressed right now. And so uh, we're going to get his version as it relates to the things like, for instance, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter here in Oregon. And what does that mean to, to the organization and whatever? He also has an upcoming event, and I want to make sure we publicize that, that event, and, and that's a very important piece. So, so Cal, welcome aboard. Thank you very much, good, 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 good. Okay. You might just, just for the benefit of the, again, for the audience and the folks and whatever, let them know a little bit about your background in terms of what your, what your real job was in terms of what you were eating, how, how you were eating here. You work for some very, very respectable folks here at the state in, the, in, uh, well, in, in Salem. Well, Bruce, uh, my... My journey as, as 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 an individual in the United States started from the time I was in college, going to the Air Force, United States Air Force, and I got out of the Air Force and I worked for three. Uh, I worked for Secretaries of States of State of Oregon. I was an election official. I was the administrator of the certi uh, the appraiser certification and licensure board. And uh, but most my most important job has been a change agent, mm -hmm. trying to make things better than I found them when I came to Oregon. Everybody knew that I was coming before I got here, and when I spent a night in Ashland and got to Corvallis, where I was going to be stationed, mm -hmm. everybody was shocked that I spent time in, in Corvallis. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know very much about Oregon at yeah. the time, but when I got here to Adair and start uh, my, my uh, term uh, uh, in, the, in the United States Air Force, Later, I met some uh, professors on campus wanted me to come back after I went to Turkey and mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, to come back and do some grad work, in which mm -hmm. I did. Okay. 
But mm -hmm. uh, uh, I just tell people basically, I'm just a change agent. Yes. And we started the Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs to get blacks involved. Excuse me, but before you get into that, though, you wouldn't even be in the change agent. In fact, you wouldn't be sitting here had it not been for your wife. I know you're married. Oh, yes, and I am this, married. This man is also is a, he's an educator, too, in his, in his own rights. In his yeah. own right. He happens to be a, a, a Ph.D., right? Yes, he picked correct. up his Ph.D. And so he's done a lot of work in the education system here within the state of Oregon. But I want to make sure I, we recognize that as you go. go well, on. But the one of the things I important that I try to stress even by myself, I want people to know me and not let some title I have to stop them yes. from getting to know me. And a lot of time people think the title sort of dictate the availability and the knowledge base that people have. And it's not necessarily. I, I find a long time ago that even though one have these degrees and they've had all those things out there, they're a lot scared to talk about it or to share with the community how we necessarily need to build the community mm -hmm. and make a big difference. Now, as I was listening to some of the discussion you had mm -hmm. early, I, I, I think a lot of time we don't want to look at the genesis mm -hmm. of the things that are happening. See, one of the biggest things that we found in this country is that we want to say that we are a nation of laws. Mm -hmm. Now, laws are the very ways that we control people. You know, I guess if we go look at the historical things of how the caveman and other people did things, then you find that what people use, they use force. If you weren't part of my uh, cult or, or my um, a little group or a tribe, then uh, you lose, you take over. But the United States, uh, uh, with the concept now, I, 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 I don't want people to hold me completely accountable for all that I'm about to say about, mm -hmm. but th being a nation of laws, the laws have been used. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. No problem. I talk with my that's hands. That's okay. That's okay. I talk with my that, hands. I understand sometimes. it. That's understand. Uh, uh, laws have been used to co control Black Americans. They've been mm -hmm. used to control White Americans. Mm -hmm. Now I grew up in Texas, just like you did. When I was growing up in Texas, I only knew two kinds of people. You were either black or white. Now, these are political terms, but they've been used to, to, uh, to categorize uh, a situation that we are facing today in many ways uh, uh, that we don't want to acknowledge that we're facing. Uh, all through the years, uh, uh, whites have been picked depicted as being in a superior position and blacks have been in an inferior position. And everybody who come to this country from other places want to be a white American rather than a black American. And and many times that misread what we're really talking about in terms of dealing with things. But I think as we move through the civil rights movement in this country, white Americans began to find out that no, they're not any better off than black American. Mm -hmm. And that is the things that you see and what really happening more than anything today. And, uh, and But people are trying to define some of the current movement in a way that is negative. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think in many ways, as we look at what is going on, we will find out that uh, blacks has been on the foreground uh, or the forefront of many of the changes that brought rights up front to all the people. And you can go back to the time when this country got its constitution. Now, there, there was no definition of what citizen mean in many ways. I guess it, it's, I'm not a historian, but go back and get some of these But issues. you are. Well, well we all are. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> we all are, but yes, I'm right, just, we, are. we all are in many so ways. Yeah. Yeah, but, but what I'm just saying is that when we go back to look at from the history of this country and, and look as to how people perceive things, you will see that the definition for citizens, for being a citizen, really came to fruition when they tried to get rid of slavery in this mm. country. When you go to the 14, 13, 14, 15th Amendment of the Constitution, you see a definition of citizen. And, and that's one of the reasons that people were talking about uh, uh, people being uh, born in the country, being a citizen automatically. Mm. Now, that was not always the case. Oh, That's all right. I, and, I, so someone is saying I, I need to go to the next, <laughs> next level, which is good. You, no, you got that one on? No, okay. no, okay. no but, but, the point, the, the, but the point I'm making is that if we don't pay attention, we find that we're 
many things are surfacing that we should not allow to to surface. Uh, and and then when when I was sharing with people about Oregon, Oregon had it such that uh, no no the U.S. said I was three fifths of, of a of a person. Oregon had it such that I couldn't even live in this state, could not own anything or do anything, and they wanted the uh, legislative body. Uh, to use penal laws to keep me out in Oregon. In Oregon, that's it, and that, that's part of its history. If you go back and look at it, but also in that same phrase, it told white Oregonians, "You would be penalized if you harbor black Americans, if you do all these other things." But people sort of forgot about how that control white Americans, hmm. or white Oregonians, to do some of the things that it was doing along those lines. And and that's one of the reasons that we tried to we're trying to develop a film we call White Landia, uh, to to share with the people of Oregon how black Oregonians and white Oregonians saw how the treatment of black Oregonians in this in this situation. And and, and two, when we began to look at what is going on around us, I heard you were just talking about black Life matters, and some people. Uh, you, uh, lives, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That person was talking about. He didn't want to look at it that way. He wanted to look at the other. But when you began to see that all these years, blacks have been on the foreground of bringing the rights for people in the state and in this country. You have to deal with the issue that black lives matters from the standpoint that it opened up the American uh, government to deal with the reality of what is happening to its people. Do they understand it? No, they don't understand it. Because Why do you they, think they don't? Because they don't understand history. They don't, history. They don't understand. But if it's not being taught in the school system, how are you going to get there? Well, well, the point of it is sometimes you have to uh, uh, go through the, the process that people go on now is uh, uh, highlighting it in the press. But at the same time, but then they're having issues. Well, at the same about time, putting it out there. yeah. Well, at the same time, the press is trying to define what that really means. But can and, they? Well, well, uh, they can put a definition out there, and many people would buy the definition because they don't want to really look at what's really being said. And and my point is that uh, we we talked about the Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs has talked about state strikes, uh, state sanctioned discrimination against Black Americans, or which is meaning which means that there are laws that are put out there on the books that de demonstrated to control Black Americans, both at the national level and at the local level. Okay, let me let me ask you this question, yes. and because I, I I know naturally I, I know a little bit more about your background as far as uh, the platform of the Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs, and you've yeah. been doing that for years. That is correct. And in all due respect, I've allowed you to I make that upfront presentation because, it, you know, the Assembly of Black Affairs has been educating, if you will, yeah. Oregonians for how many years? How many? Oh, well, well, it started in 1977. 1977. Yeah. yeah. And I and I also know that uh, you you are very active, if you will, in the uh, in the election process where you invite folks across the board right to both come, Democrats and Republicans you know, and to talk about these issues and again to go through an educational process so they get some sense of, of what is going on yes. and such that they can kind of make a decision based on that so you, you you've got your own educational tool aspect of it you got me uh, that I know of okay yes. that you do on an ongoing basis we only have about 15 minutes so I want to make sure that we spend some time on because Dr. Henry I, I, we'll bring Dr. Henry back here and give us some more you give us some more a little bit more of the background aspect of it but I want to talk a little bit more about some some of the current issues there that are sort of bar sure. bothering Oregonian aspect of it. You hit on a little bit of it from the standpoint of uh, uh, your definition of uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, if you will, because everybody has that different definition. Yeah. You saw that on the first first short, first part of the show that I had here once before. Uh, one, I'd like for you to expand a little bit on that piece, and and how should we handle that piece? Well, well, see, in Oregon, uh, in, uh, uh, this is one of the issues that we're going to bring up in our meeting on the 12th of, of, of September, is that how should Black Lives Matters be viewed in the state of Oregon? Right. And, uh, and, and, and the point of it, let me, let me say that, when we talk about state-sanctioned discrimination, we need to know what we're really talking about and, and how we can view it. 
Black Lives Matters is a movement that highlights state-sanctioned discrimination against black Americans and against Americans in general. But at the same time, it's that people who don't want to know that blacks have been singled out, they will try to define it. They will try to set up and say okay. they shouldn't be involved in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, and my point is that the, the young people today are looking for answers and when i walk when i observe young black uh, americans across the country but they, what about oregon what about here in, in oregon well, it's what the you, same thing the, the, the same thing here in oregon i've talked to a number of them Let me give you an example i talked to several of the young uh black leaders here in portland and i asked them one question mm -hmm. who is responsible for the safety of blacks or go, uh, black or Portland. You know what they said to what me? What did they say? The police. The police, okay, all right. Oh, and okay. I, oh, no, and I said... Good thing? Was that a good thing? Uh, it's not a good answer. Okay, okay. And I said, the police isn't responsible. But why did they say that to you? Because they see the police as the one that has the power. Uh, or, uh, it's trying to enforce the control of black people in the city of Portland. Now, and that's part of some of the, what they're saying. They don't... It, but they don't see the police as an instrument of the mayor and the city mm -hmm. g government. You know, you not a few a few years ago, one of the things that the Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs observed: the police marched against City Hall. Mm -hmm. Now, now that was a rude awakening. We shared that with the mayor and the uh, and the city government mm -hmm. about who's controlling who. See, in many instances, most policemen think they control city government rather than city government uh, 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 providing the, uh, the regulation that they operate by. Now, you heard individual talking about he want to believe what the police said. But, but, but we got to get the mayor and the city government understanding they are allowing these things to happen in the city. They can change the rules and give the direction in which the, the police operate. But now you do agree on that particular point that uh, that the voters, if you will, are citizens. Uh, that's why we're having this concern right now in terms of <laughs> politics. The, the, the presidential race, the gubernatorial race, and this, that, and the other. The fact people are really fed up with politicians. Well, but, but see, know, well, what's they, the deal? But, but see, they don't understand that they are politicians too. They are politicians too. Dude, everybody is uh, is a polit is, is a politician, whether we like it or not. So how do we change it? How do, how do we, change we got to we got to let people know that we view them as a as a political entity. So as who's going to do that? Well, the other citizens who know. The other citizens who know. Uh, and you're, people you're an educator. You spend a lot of time here in the Portland metropolitan area and the Portland public schools district aspect of it. What about the education system? You know, the, what you the things that you're bringing up right now are not being taught in the school. Well, it's no question about that. But see, why hasn't that why hasn't that changed? If you don't mind sharing, we got Portland public, the largest public school system here, <laughs> i.e., the blacks the, uh, ident identified, if you will, as as the black population here, right in the state of Oregon aspect of it. You got all the other entities and whatever. Why haven't they taken that on? That at least to get our citizens involved in terms of educating in that background. Well, see, I, I have a simple little statement that, that others may not agree with me on. What's it? It's that, it's that fear is a good way of controlling people. Okay. And what people have seen happen is that their livelihood or whatever they think is important to them uh, go away from them when they stand up for some of the issues that we have. And, and, and the point of it is that you can't bring about change unless you're willing to use what you know to affect the kind of change that we're seeing happen. Now, there are a lot of good people who, who think they're, they, they're doing the right thing. But when you have years of conditioning process that is done by uh, the education process and the judicial process, it's hard to get people to want to move away from those things. Mm -hmm. See, uh, I often think that uh, when when our education system are afraid to tell people that uh, they have rights, 
I, you know, I, I, I taught some people who want to become teachers, and I asked them, "What a, could you give me five rights that everybody in the country has?" And they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it because they saw they didn't see their rights the same as a black person's rights. So why did they accept the job? They, I mean, you're talking about blacks. You got you got blacks within the system, right? Well, I'm talking about well, people no, no. are relying on them to do that too, right? Well, well, they, not only you can't blame blacks alone. I, I was I talking that. about. I understand that. We're talking about the next generation of people who are going to be out there teaching individuals. Right. Right. If they don't understand that all our rights are the same, and that we need to be working together to make sure these rights happen, mm -hmm. see, one of the th things that the Black uh, Lives Matter uh, movement is putting forth is getting young people to understand their rights and also to share their rights with whites, mm -hmm. to get the support of those individuals so that they can make a big difference together. But what about but, the leadership uh, as far as the? the elderly blacks or the blacks who are in leadership positions, should they not actually put the, there's got to be some educational process within the system, right? Wouldn't you agree? Well, I don't, I, I, I agree. I don't disagree with that aspect. Mm -hmm. But but at the same time, we have to recognize that some of them uh, uh, may not be where they ought to be. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, uh, and then we have to be willing to work with each other. See, uh, uh, the big things about blacks in this country, to a large degree, we have not been willing to work with each other to solve our own problems. Why, or is, to that? Why is that so, Cal? Well, well, can you uh, give me any uh, thoughts about that? Of what? You've, I you've told been you been around. You've been, but my point is that you've been lecturing. I, I'm, but trust me, for the years you have been lecturing in the Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs, because I know I know where your heart is on this peace aspect of it, and you've been having those discussions on both sides, especially during those political times, the election time aspect of it. Are they getting it? Why aren't they getting it? Well, see, they know, but they've been conditioned not to act. See, I remember when I first, one of the things that the Oregonian did here in, in Poland, they used to be able to write every, I assume every year, the year that I heard about this, as to decide who are the black leaders in Portland. Right. And I, and I ran into a couple of individuals who, were, who cried, saying the Oregonian did not acknowledge them as a leader. See, I never care whether people acknowledge me as a leader. I just have something to offer. Mm -hmm. and did they take? Did they take your your list? Huh? Did they take your? your no, I I didn't try to. You didn't try to. I didn't try to say who was leaders. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about in terms of uh, what I have done here in the state. When right. I organized the Corrales Branch NAACP, the Oregonian came down and wanted to interview me as the next black leader in the state of right, Oregon. Right. I refused to uh, to let them interview me. One of the things I said to them, when I have something to say, I, I send you a, a, a press release. That, in, in some minute, that bothered them a great deal because I didn't want nobody to come up and say that I was leading all the blacks in the state yeah. of Oregon. That was not. But what I was willing to do is set up and look at what was going on and try to get some way in which we could solve. But why do you one? Why do you think they they approach you that way? Because and they were two, controlling what, what are, all and what, other. And where do they get that support from? You know, in all due respect, the person that comes to mind is is a very well known person here with the Oregonian. He's since retired, Bill Hilliard. You know, he's been there for years, you know, he's, he's, he was nationally known and this, that, and the other, uh, supposedly a very respectful, if you will, journalist aspect of it. And uh, did, didn't he get it while he was doing that? Well, I can't speak for Bill here. Okay. But what I can speak for is that the Oregonian has a duty to report the news. Right. And I saw many times... But well, they normally go to the black leaders to get the news uh, well, about not, the masses. Uh, no, no, well, see... Fair? N not, that's not a fair question. Okay, all right. Because well, what I, should be the point is, if their job is to report the news, it shouldn't matter. But if they don't know and they don't have the background, what, what, well, they, well, what, what do they go? They would go where the news is. Okay. And then try to, uh, or where the report should be done and shared with the people. Okay. See, the big point is that the Oregonian, just like all the others, was trying to control both blacks and whites right. about okay. what is going on. Okay. So if they don't give the white people the information, they think that uh, all the blacks are wrong. That's okay. like right now, we're seeing what's happening with the Black Lives Matters. Mm -hmm. People are not really looking at 
state sanctioned discrimination as the root of a lot of these things. Well do me this way. In fact I'm gonna give you the whole give the whole card out to the to the viewing artist at this point in time because if you give it if you give the whole card they won't attend your ten your I know I understand meeting. So we got about two minutes about two minutes left. I want you to spend a little bit more time in terms of your upcoming events, where it's gonna be, where it's going to be, the time if you will, and get the date again and what are some of the, the, the things that you're gonna be doing at that event. Well, one of the main, main uh, the event is going to be held at the AME Church at uh, Vancouver and Skidmore. Okay, Vancouver and Skidmore. Well, here okay. in Portland. Okay. On uh, September the 12th, uh, the general membership start, at, uh, a meeting starts at 10 o'clock in the morning and okay. goes to noon. Okay. It is open to the public. Okay. And uh, uh, we'll be talking about several key issues. One of them is uh, Black Life matters okay. as, a, as an issue because we need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. and we're also going to look at some of the birth <laughs> birthright citizenship. Oh, birthright citizenship. Sounds like Planned Parenthood to me. You no. You ain't going to talk about that at all? No, no we're talking. I mean, you know, we got this, you got this outfit here on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. I'm, people still asking the question, if you will, well, as a result that? of the national news from the standpoint about well, what they've been doing in regards to black folks. Well, we we got a presidential race coming up next year, and we've had some people who want to talk about getting rid of the 14th Amendment. Okay. Now, uh, people need to understand what that really means. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to bring you back, Dr. Dr. <laughs> Henry, back on this other piece. But we, we only have about a few more minutes. I want I want to make sure that people know where, you, where you're going to be having this session on that, what is it, 16th? On the 12th. The 12th, 12th of September. 12th, 12th of September. September. You, yeah. Is there a phone number that they can call and, and get information background from you? Well, they can call them. Yeah, they can call 541-745-5570. One more time. 541-745-5570. Okay, good. That's a very important piece. We only have but a few more minutes here. Well, back to about, about, 30, about 20 seconds, if you will, at the most. And uh, I wanted to make sure that you were able to get that piece on. But you're always a va valuable uh, interview, if you, if, you, if you will, because the fact of the matter is you've got all of this information and right up front with it, it needs to be shared because you've been, you've been doing this for years and years. On and, this piece. And, and that's what I've been trying to do more than anything. Uh, as a change agent, I'm just trying to share what I have so that others can check it out and help. Uh, change our society. Good, good. Well, Cal, we're going to get you back on. In fact, after the event, would you mind coming back and you can just kind of share with us in terms of what, what, what did Certainly transpire? Certainly, glad, okay, we're glad to. Well, good. Thank you very much for being with us, buddy. And thanks for giving me this few moments to share. Okay, it's always a pleasure, Cal. Okay. Dr. Henry. All right. Okay, good. Thank you very much, folks, for, for being with us, and we really appreciate the fact that um, uh, you know we were able to do this here on, on uh, I, I call it the People's Channel, if you will. Uh, it's a it's it's very positive. It's a, something that we need if you will stay involved and by the way, please register the vote register the vote Take care. Have a good evening. I'll see you later